Good morning, I'm Trifina representing in unit three and we'll continue to contribute to what to expect when you're expecting. Um, so this is uh, the story of two patients we had recently. The first one was a 31 year old Gravida three, para one living one who was booked in CMC and she uh, stays at Zaidapet Velour. Um, she had antenatal risk factors of gestational diabetes uh, detected right from 12 plus five weeks and she was on oral antidiabetic medications as well as insulin. She presented at 23 plus six weeks gestational age with a fever for two days, which was high grade intermittent associated with chills and rigors and relieved with medication temporarily. It was also associated with one episode of vomiting and uh, it was predominantly food particles. There were no loose stools associated. There was no blood in the vomitus. There were no other localizing symptoms at admission. Um, there was no history of consumption of food from outside and she claims she drinks boiled and cooled water, and there are no other family members with similar symptoms. On clinical examination, she was conscious, cooperative, um, slightly tachycardic, 98 per minute. Blood pressure was normal. Um, she was febrile at admission, 102 far, uh, Fahrenheit. There was no rash, and there were no other significant findings on general examination. The abdomen was soft, non-tender. The uterus corresponded to her gestation of 24 weeks, and fetal movements were palpable. Uh, cardiovascular, respiratory, and central nervous system examination did not reveal any positive findings. The second patient um, is currently admitted. She's a 23-year-old primary gravida at 20 plus one weeks gestational age with a DCDA twin uh, gestation. She was also booked in CMC and she resides at uh, Nekar Taluk. Um, she presented with a fever of uh, three days. It was high grade, intermittent, associated with chills and rigors, relieved with medication temporarily. Um, this was associated with two episodes of loose tooth. She, she described it as pasty and yellow. There was no blood. If there was some mild associated abdominal pain. There was no vomiting and there were no other localizing symptoms at admission. She um, says there's no history of consumption. She cannot recollect any consumption of food from outside. Um, when we asked about drinking water source, uh, they mentioned that they drink water drawn from the well and uh, they don't necessarily boil it. No other family members had any similar symptoms. On clinical examination, she was conscious, cooperative. Um, pulse rate was 88 a minute. She was also febrile at admission, 101. There was no rash. There were no other uh, positive findings on general examination. The abdomen, the uterus uh, was, uh, as expected, larger than uh, dates, corresponding to 24 weeks, um, and fetal movements were palpable. There was no tenderness in the abdomen. Uh, CVS, RS, and CNS, um, no positive findings were um, um, made. I just invite you to put down the obvious differentials. Thank you. Um, so we did consider those differentials um, and we also uh, sent off the urine analysis um, in case there was a urinary tract infection because um, the first lady wasn't exactly sure. Um, uh, the first patient's investigations, uh, she is immunocompetent. Bloodborne vital scan was negative. She had a mild anemia at present day. At presentation, 9.5. MCV was 85. Uh, total counts were 8,200. Platelets were 2.4. Creatinine was normal. The blood culture, which was sent at admission, grew salmonella typhi on the third day. 
um, she was initially started on uh, piperazolin and azithromycin. When we uh, got the blood culture, we stopped the piperazolin and uh, continued the azithromycin. Urine analysis in the first patient was negative. Um, in, on the third day, she complained of um, uh, epigastric and left hypochondrial pain. So uh, an ultrasound abdomen was requested and uh, it showed a hepatomegaly of 18 centimeters and a spleen of 12.5 centimeters and confirmed the single live intrauterine gestation. The second patient was also immunocompetent. Um, anemia was present, 9.6. It dropped to about 8.6 and last night's value was 7.9. Total counts at admission were 10,500, dropped to 5,400 after about three days and picked up to 8,600 last night. Platelets were 2.42, dropped to 1.96 and have picked up to 2.56 now. The creatinine is normal, 0.43. Uh, blood culture also grew salmonella typhi. Um, I forgot to, I, I, I failed to mention that the second patient is 23, but she's undergone treatment for um, conceiving. So she's undergone an IUI. And um, possibly because of that, they sought medical help quite early. They came in with just two days of fever. Um, her urinalysis actually showed a WBC of 17. Bacteria, there was three plus. Nitrites were negative, however. Um, so because we've discussed enteric fever quite a bit over this past month, I just wanted to focus on three aspects of enteric fever in, and the pregnancy. Uh, so, uh, we know that typhoid fever, it, um, the outcomes have drastically improved after antibiotics have come in. But if untreated in pregnancy, abortion rates can be very, very high, as high as 80%. I'm so just focusing on three small aspects of enteric fever in pregnancy. So, we look a little about the outcome of pregnancy when, some, uh, when a patient has enteric fever. Um, is there any vertical transmission and a little bit about drug safety in pregnancy with regard to enteric fever. Um, so there's not much of studies actually that uh, have looked into this combination. Uh, so there's actually plenty to do in this arena. Uh, in 2007, there's a, a risk control study from Pakistan. It is a um, 450 bedded uh, university hospital where they looked at the 11 year experience of women who tested positive with enteric fever. And they compared their pregnant women with typhoid versus the non-pregnant ones. And uh, they also tried to match those who were pregnant uh, with age-matched um, uh, controls uh, to see whether there's any apparent difference in pregnancy outcome. And they were not able to show any difference in the pregnancy outcome in terms of gestational age, pregnancy complications, birth weight or APGA scores. Um, most of their typhoids in pregnancy uh, happen to occur in the second and the third trimester. Um, pregnancy, so they concluded that pregnancy doesn't necessarily increase severity of illness or the complications. Um, they also found that uh, fever after admission to the hospital lasted about a day longer in those with, uh, in, in women with pregnancy-related typhoid and uh, as compared to 4.2 days in those who were not pregnant. And the relapse rates that they got were similar in both groups. Um, uh, their uh, declared complications of typhoid fevers were significantly higher in non-pregnant women. They don't really go into that discussion, but we can probably assume that pregnant women are a vulnerable population and probably seek help a little earlier. Complications in the pregnancy-related group related, um, included three cases of lower GI bleeds, and uh, there were single cases of sepsis, sepsis with DIC and cholecystitis. Um, so, uh, next point we wanted to just highlight was um, the vertical transmission of salmonella typhi, which is possible. Um, this is, uh, there aren't many uh, case series as such, very few scattered case reports. This is one of them in 2013. This is from Cambodia. There's a traveler actually who didn't realize she was pregnant. At about 11 weeks, she had presented with fever and um, she was in her first trimester. Uh, um, she actually got, they detected salmonella typhi and gave her two weeks of appropriate antibiotics, but she went on and she was discharged, but at 16 weeks she came back and um, she had a miscarriage. Um, uh, um, the, uh, they were able to um, process the uh, fetus and um, demonstrate that there was salmonella typhi in the fetal lung tissue. The, uh, the placenta was also noted to be bulky and probable choriamnionitis because of vertical transmission was suspected. 
Um, pregnancy, so uh, in their case report, they actually differ from, it's just a case report, but in their opinion, you can, um, uh, the pregnancy outcomes can be um, uh, bad, even if um, uh, treated adequately for 14 days with azithromycin as they did, especially if it's in the first trimester and patients need to be alerted. Um, there are plenty of um, small case reports on uh, severe non-typhoidal salponella infection as well and fetal loss. Um, especially if there is disseminated infection, and that's possible in any trimester. Uh, there's another case report here about another non-typhoidal salmonella during pregnancy, um, causing a septic abortion and um, uh, also causing acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, this is another case report of a fatal transplacental infection with non-typhoidal salmonella. Um, we then just move on to the drug safety. So we use, we tend to um, avoid fluoroquinolones and we go in for, um, because we know about the resistance and we go in for azithromycin 20 milligrams per kilograms IV if they're not tolerating orally and can be um, converted to oral as soon as they can tolerate orally as we did with our patients. Uh, we give it for a minimum of seven to 10 days. Um, uh, the drug safety in pregnancy, now the uh, labeling has moved from 2015 to, uh, they don't call it A, B, C, D, X anymore. The FDA calls it the PLLR, which is the Pregnancy and Lactation Labeling um, Rules. And uh, basically, they just tell you what is, um, um, it collects data on pregnant women and as well as um, patients in the reproductive age um, and uh, tells us about the risks in each of those populations. Um, so the azithromycin that we commonly use is compatible for use during pregnancy, thankfully. It does cross the placenta and is present in the amniotic fluid. Um, um, Uptodate does say that there can be some amount of alterations in pharmacokinetic properties in azithromycin in pregnancy. Uh, third generation keflosporins um, are an alternative in case QTC is prolonged and they can be, they are also compatible for use during pregnancy. They also cross the placenta and uh, pharmacokinetics following multiple doses in the third trimester are quite similar to those in non-pregnant patients. Um, a last word on vaccines. If a pe pregnant patient wants to travel to an area which is endemic for typhoid, uh, the inactivated VI polysaccharide vaccine is what we would advise. Um, just a little word on the outcome of our, of our patients. Um, uh, patient one was discharged well with no complications. The piperazolin tazobactam was changed to azithromycin one gram. She got it for a, uh, she completed it for a course of eight days. Um, the second patient has defovest after three days of azithromycin. Her blood culture still hasn't cleared the salmonella type B. Um, she hasn't uh, thankfully had any complications so far. She had initially been started by the parent unit on piperazolin tazobactam and escalated to meropenem, which we then stopped once we had the diagnosis of um, salmonella typhi. She is currently on astromycin 1 gram OD and tolerating well orally. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Trubina. Are there any questions or comments? At the state of typhoid somehow this year, I don't know whether other units are also seeing the similar picture there. Last, last couple of years, I think before that we didn't really see typhoid for quite a bit. But uh, I wonder if it coincides with the rains and broken pipes and uh, um, drink, uh, drinking water getting contaminated as well. It's quite likely in our likely. But why didn't we see it in the last two, three years or something? I don't know. Yeah. Related to road Maybe now people yeah. are uh, out and about much more digging up the roads <laughs> as opposed to during <laughs> lockdown. Something for my husband to work on. Maybe. So both both the patients you are presented are in the second trimester, no? Okay. I think uh, Dr. Tafina has tried to highlight that uh, uh, the patients who had uh, vertical transmission uh, were mostly in the first trimester and in second and third trimester, complication rates were comparatively lesser and uh, and the fever did not really have an impact on the outcome and the severity of, of illness did not correlate with pregnancy outcomes in the second and third trimester. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Trafina. We'll move to the next presentation. Uh, Dr. Alsi from Medicine